Hello, my name is Ray Kulo. Uh, today we are going to do an overview on my 15 pound combat robot called Ankle Biter. As you can see, the robot is currently not here on this table because the competition was last year in April and since then it's been taken apart and modified and tested a little bit for my version 2, which is what this video is supposed to be on. But since I don't have the parts for the version 2 yet because of the virus going around, we are going to today look at my version 1. So, gotta go assemble it, so let's go get the robot. Now that we have Ankle Biter assembled, I can give you a little more backstory on the robot. So this robot was built my senior year during high school, uh, mainly because growing up I saw BattleBots and I thought, ooh, it's really cool, robots fighting each other. And I was so intrigued. And then I found out that our school actually had a BattleBots team about eight years before my senior year, or eight or 10 years before my senior year. So I went to the tech ed teacher who used to be the mentor and I asked him, if possibly I could get funding and start a BattleBots team and surprisingly he actually said yes so that is how Inklebiter uh, was made. I had help from my two friends Jacob and Ethan they were part of the team so we built this robot for the Bots IQ event in Waukesha Wisconsin. Uh, Inklebiter did pretty well um, in R for us it didn't actually do that good in the whole competition, but we felt what we learned from the competition um, was really good. And then also just how the robot performed when um, it was actually working properly. I'll get to that later. We had a bunch of problems in the beginning of the day. So I'm going to uh, now give you kind of a top-down overview of the robot. So this is the top-down view of Ankle Biter. Um, so there are a few things missing from Ankle Biter still. There are all of the ESCs I currently not have in here. I would put them in here, but I'm lazy and I also don't want to weigh zip ties since I'll be taking this apart pretty soon anyways. Um, I also, the top cover that goes over it, I do not know where that has gone within the last year, as well as the under skid plate. Also, these slides that go on the front here on Ankle Biter, I did not put those on because I don't have screws for them at the moment. Other than that, this is basically the entire robot as it was at competition. I also did not put the two rad er, receivers on. Okay, so for Inklebiter's armor, we have uh, three pieces of polycarbonate, or the big main pieces. They're all 3 8 inch thick, and we also have uh, two pieces of polycarbonate up at the front here as a little protection, and then also we use those to screw in our armor pieces to the frame. The reason why we use polycarbonate over something like aluminum or uh, titanium 
is more for weight savings and then also polycarbonate is a little cheaper and we use it more as replaceable armor so say we get into a match and one of our pieces of armor get destroyed we try to make it so we're able to replace all the pieces of the armor in the match Okay, so now that I have all these pieces of armor, you can kind of see how they're just rectangles. These holes are accidentally drilled to receive a quarter 20 instead of a 1024 like we are using, uh, which didn't make too much of a difference until you get to this end piece, where since the hole is too big, it got a little close and snapped here. But if you can see our piece of armor, these are all the original ones. We never replaced them at all. They didn't really receive too much damage. This one got a few nicks right here from when we ran into another bot, but other than that, all these are they're pretty on they're pretty good we can reuse these as m many times until they break or get destroyed we put some uh weight saving pockets in here it didn't really do too much and i think it actually probably hindered the armor's ability to be armor but it worked well For the top and bottom armor, we use 16th inch polycarbonate. Some people were telling us that we probably should have used like a, a piece of titanium on top or some other type of thicker material to protect the top and bottom of our robot. The reason why we went with 16th inch light, or polycarbonate was for weight and then also after watching a bunch of different videos from the 15 pound and 12 pound weight class for combat robots, there's not many robots that actually come and try to attack from the top or the that's why we have thin uh, sheets of polycarb. It's basically to keep our electronics from coming out or if a robot drives on top of us, it's to keep the robot from getting into our electronics. It's not meant to protect, it's just meant to keep things co from coming in and out. Also, for these side pieces up here, we're for the next, com or the for Inklebiter version two, we're actually switching to aluminum. We feel like these are a little more structural because they're actually holding on our other pieces of armor. So we are switching to aluminum for those to give more rigidity. And then also in the back where we have our sheet that bolts on here with our other sheet, we are putting two triangles back here so we don't have this big opening where people can come and get a good grab on us. So it's just some things we're going to be improving with the next uh, version 2 of this robot. For our frame, uh, the entire frame is made out of 70, 75 aluminum, besides this one piece back here, which is 3 8 inch polycarbonate. We, it's kind of a pretty simple frame where you just have your two sides and you have a few cross members. If you look on the side here, we try to make it so we only had two screws on each side holding our entire frame together. This front cross member right here is actually slotted into the side. And then this back member back here, is also sliding so where it slides up and down on these little slots the reason why we did this is uh, one to reduce the amount of failure points that we could have so our the only failure points basically to take our frame apart are the screws back here and then also it would be easier to work on so if we wanted to work on the weapon or the motor or anything all we had to do is take one side off and then it'd be easier to work on during the competition, we actually did not have any problems with our frame, even though there are a few things that we will be tweaking for our version 2, which I will get to that later. The two cross members in the front here, these are both, as well, 7075 aluminum, the same on the outside, but these are only a quarter inch thick, while these side pieces are 3 eighths inch thick. The weapon system on ankle biter is supposed to be the thing that stands out for our whole bot. We right now currently have a vertical spinner, so it spins upwards. Uh, it is a live shaft, so the weapon is keyed directly into the shaft and the shaft spins with the weapon. 
which means there's a bushing on each side that the weapon goes in. We had a few problems with that, so that is, I'll talk about the changes we're doing with that in a little bit. Uh, we are using a Turnigy 3648 by 1450 kV brushless motor with a 12 tooth pulley on it, and I believe the pulley on the weapon goes up to a 30 or a 32 tooth. I'll put some calculation on the screen uh, at the theoretical RPM that it should go. Right now, uh, or, or the strike head for our weapon are these bolts. They're uh, steel bolts that should dig into the other robot. You can see that there is a bolt missing in the front or in the middle on both of these sides. That is because we stripped out this bolt hitting a cinder block with it in order to make it more balanced, we took this one out. The weapon is 6061 aluminum and it was machined on a vertical or a horizontal mill. And then right now we currently have this pulley screwed directly into our weapon. For our actual competition, it was not like that. This is just a test setup for the version 2 that we are making. The weapon has actually more shifted over this way, and the pulley was also keyed directly to the shaft. The steel shaft for the weapon is, a low, or a, I believe, a low-carbon steel bar. For our actual competition, we needed to save some weight, so we actually put a 1024 10, uh, aluminum bar in here, which looking back wasn't the greatest decision because actually in our competition we ended up bending that bar so then at competition we had to put back in this steel bar which since we were over the weight we had to take off a piece of our armor if you will see in some of the uh, fights that we did some people wonder sometimes what these bearings right here are for these are actually our belt tensioner we needed something to tension the belt but we wanted it to be somewhat durable and not break in mid-combat because when this hits another robot, there are a lot of forces transferred through the belt into our motor. So we put bearings here because they're fairly durable. And also, if you notice, our belt has a bit of slop still. That is so when we actually hit another robot, the belt will be able to slip on this pulley so our motor does not take all the forces of our big bar just stopping. So it lets the inertia of the motor keep going. So for Inklebiter's drive system, we are using a two wheel skid drive. So these blocks right here actually go underneath the robot. They bolt in right here and it is meant to be powered by these two back wheels and then slide on these two blocks. So currently we are using a uh, Bainbot five, or RS550 motors, uh, brushed motors into P61 gearboxes with a 26 to one gear ratio. And then we are using a pair of two and seven inch, two and seven eighth inch in diameter Bainbot wheels. And then on the front here, these skids are just uh, 3D printed. We used to have them out of polycarbonate, but we broke a few, so we need to mass produce them. And then also 3D printing them. We can make them various heights to lower and raise the front of a robot from the ground. Both of these motors were powered off an old pair of Bainbot ESCs, which I currently do not know where they are, but I'll put a picture of them up on the screen. And then those, uh, the entire thing is powered by uh, these LIFE or lithium ferride batteries. These are both 3300 milliamps and 6.6 .6 volt. We have them wired in series, so the uh, final output voltage is being run at 13.2 volts. So for our electronics, everything starts with the batteries, which I kind of previously already explained. Uh, the batteries sit in this 3D printed uh, shell right here. We didn't have any problems with this, but we will be changing this design for our next robot. From the batteries, the we have our Team Wayachi battle switch. This switch worked very well. Use an Allen key in order to turn it on and off. That is so in the middle of battle, you don't hit something and then a uh, switch flips. It's pretty expensive, but it works fairly well. We have our power distributor that takes the power from the batteries and distributes it to our three ESCs, the two for our drive wheels and the one that's for our brushless motor. The ESC we use for the brushless motor, the Turnigy brushless motor, is a Turnigy 
100 amp K-Force ESC. Uh, this is another ESC that is fairly old and they don't sell anymore, but my school had it, so I think it's, and it worked fairly well, so I took it. As I previously mentioned, we had two brushed ESCs for these two wheels. And then we also, our two receivers we used, we used two receivers. One is a an AR610, and then we also used a AR410. The reason why we had two receivers is right before competition is when we finally got everything done or was powering it up. We were trying to run these two drive wheels on the two sticks of the controller and then run the weapon on one of these auxiliary switches. We could not get full uh, current and we can also, I don't know, adjust the weapon speed with using it on one of the auxiliary switches. So we actually added in a second receiver to another controller so we had a primary and a secondary driver. The primary driver, uh, the AR610 was used for, it drove the robot with the two joysticks. And the second driver used the AR410 and then they controlled the weapon with just one of the joysticks. The controller we used are a pair of DX6Is from Spectrum. These are just controllers that my school had, so it's what we used. So now it's time to talk about the issues that we had with Anglebiter. Yes, our robot isn't perfect. It's just like every other robot. If there's a robot that is perfect, uh, I would like to know about it because all robots have issues with them. So we had three main issues with our robot at competition. The first one, which was also, it was the least detrimental to our robot at competition, were the very old ESCs that we used for these back wheels. Because they were so old and kind of out of date, what we were trying to make them do, uh, they just weren't capable of. So we kept overheating them and they would cut out during our match. So that was the smallest issue we had was just cutting out our ESCs. The second biggest issue was with our weapon system. So we have that live shaft that goes all the way through here that has to go in the two bushings that are in each side of the frame. Because we have that shaft that goes all the way through, these two bushing holes have to be almost perfectly aligned to make our weapon spin nicely. Well, since we had only two screws back here holding our robot together on each side, we had this much room for the aluminum to bend. So you can kind of see the frame bends out. Well, when we hit someone with our weapon, it would make our, all the forces that go into here would make our frame bend out which would make our weapon actually bind up and destroy our bushings in the side. So we had a few times where we'd hit someone and it would cause our bushings to bind up, which would basically make our weapon useless throughout the rest of the fight. That was the second biggest issue. All right, so the third biggest issue was with our traction. We, in our match, we would try to spin our wheels in order to move, and we wouldn't be able to move. We would just spin the wheels. So the reason for that was because we almost have no weight over these uh, wheels back here. We basically have this part of the frame and our back plate is basically all the weight we ha currently have going over these wheels. These skids in the front have a very large surface area on both sides with all the weight of basically our battery and our big heavy weapon, which is probably about a third of our entire robot's weight. Because of that, these skids had a lot of static friction that we had to overcome, and we just couldn't get enough traction on our back wheels in order to push our robot forward. Those three issues were the biggest issues that we had with Inklebiter version one. There were a few other uh, issues that we had that aren't really too detrimental to the version two that we were making. So, we wanted to focus on those three issues. The first issue was with the two ESCs in back here. We were fixing that by getting uh, brand new ESCs and then also switching our motors to brushless, which we are using these. They're using brushless ESCs, which are, hopefully the system will be more reliable. It will also weigh less. And because it's all newer, we hopefully shouldn't overheat and basically burn out our ESCs as easily. The second issue, which was with our weapon system, 
because that we had that live shaft that went all the way through here. We're trying to fix that by making the shaft up here a dead shaft. So this is the weapon so far for our version two. If you can notice that this weapon actually spins around the shaft, that is because the bushings are now actually inside this weapon. Here's our shaft. The shaft is actually uh, has two flats in it that will actually fit into our side pieces. So the shaft will not move at all. And because uh, we now have a screw hole, this will actually now be a structural member in front that will hopefully help our front part from not having to bow out like this. That is the how we're trying to fix the issue with our weapon binding up is by making a dead shaft with the weapon just spinning around the shaft. Our third issue was with traction. So there's not too many things we can do to try to fix that. The first thing we did is we actually shortened our chassis up quite a bit. We have a few more inches that our wheels are closer. We basically just eliminated this space right here, making our wheels as close to this motor as possible. That will also, that will bring the center of gravity of the robot hopefully closer to these wheels back here. The second thing we're doing to try to help that is these batteries right here on our next robot or on the version two, they'll actually go on top of the wheels. So we'll have more weight on top of these wheels. The third thing that we're doing to try to help with our traction issues is by getting rid, is by getting rid of the skids up front. So instead of having these that we skid on, we're having these uh, transfer bearings that will actually be mounted on the underside. Oh, there goes the batteries, oops. They'll be mounted on this underside right here. So we'll have a lot less, we'll almost have no friction up in front. Uh, this could be bad, this could be good. We might have so, we might not have enough friction up front. So when we spin the weapon up, our robot kind of wanders a bit. But if these do not work, hopefully all the other fixes we did will help enough that we can use skids, but we'll try to use polycarbon instead because it's a little more slide even material than these uh, 3D printed PLA. Just one minute old, two minutes. 